Hey, it's C.S. Joseph with csjoseph.life doing another episode on social compatibility, this time for the INFJ, because who doesn't like watching videos on YouTube or listening on podcasts about INFJs? Because apparently anything MBTI related has to, like, is dominated by the INFJ audience for some reason. So I could be wrong, though. It might be INTJ or INTP or INFP, but. Top four introvert intuitives love MBTI related subjects, even though technically I'm kind of anti MBTI because I really don't care for the MBTI test. And MBTI is nothing but a test. I mean, I use the letters just to, because that's the title of the types that people are used to. Otherwise, I kind of really don't care that much, but that's neither here nor there. So social compatibility for the INFJ, I mean, I try to make promises again, like I did with my last lecture, that this is going to be a short lecture, but I don't know. So we'll see where it goes, how long it takes. Definitely not more than an hour, though. That's ridiculous. And I don't think I've gotten to an hour on any of my lectures, even one time. So we'll see how that happens. Maybe I'll get to an hour today. It'll be great. You know, got to torture everyone, right? So uh, social compatibility with INFJs. INFJs are... See it through, finisher, uh, chart the course types. That is their interaction style. That means they're direct, responding, movement. Uh, they are idealists, very people-oriented, people-focused, always seeking the ideal, uh, able to manipulate social situations uh, as a result of their idealism. Uh, they, they're very perfectionistic, uh, always trying to seek to be the person who's delivering the absolute best possible experience. The purpose of the INFJ's life is basically to improve other people and to make people better. It's kind of like, uh, I don't know, if you ever watch, it's like that superpower in Heroes, the red lightning that uh, uh, Ando had, which was Hero's uh, partner, and his red lightning would supercharge other uh, people's superpowers and make them stronger. That's like the INFJ. You know, hey man, I'm going to give you a hug because I love you so much. Oh, you're so energized by my hug. Okay, go fly, free, free, be free, save the world, and conquer all those that oppose you because I gave you a hug, right? That's like the INFJ way of, you know, uh, of conducting magical powers is by, you know, through their hugs or their touch or their... Um, or their appearance, or you know, the experience that they're giving others, uh, and how they craft it, etc. Or the reality checks that they give people, right? Although that's not to say an INFJ does not need a reality check. I mean, if you want one of those, just go watch my Who Are the INFJs lecture, which is uh, a controversial lecture to say the least. Um, but about that, I would actually like to address INFJs about that. Just understand that with all my lectures, so my lectures, I plan to make them more negative sounding or more positive sounding on purpose. It's because I want to have like different waves going up and down. And honestly, I'm tired of YouTube uh, people or podcasts talking about INFJs like these dainty little fairy things that have super powerful magical powers and give Twilight Sparkle a bad name while maximizing Rainbow Dash all the way around. You know, I, I really don't think that's relevant or useful to anyone and they're trying to understand you. So it's important to make sure that not only do I talk about the good things, but I also criticize you because I've had INFJs criticize me my whole life. I mean, my mentor who is an INFJ, who taught me a lot about what I know about type, R.P. Moriel, he himself is an INFJ. And his TI child lit me on fire consistently for two years. And basically because of that, his TI child literally burned the lies away, the lies that I was, that I was living because I was literally leading a life with a foundation of lies. There was no truth in me whatsoever. And because of his TI child, I am here today. So I am very grateful for INFJs and what they can do in this life. I may be super, super mega critical of INFJs, but I'm also super mega critical of other types too. I mean, ENFPs consistently complain that I'm overly critical towards them. I've gotten it from INFPs uh, as well. I've gotten it from ISFJs. So the point is, doesn't matter what type it is, I'm doing uh, lectures that are more positive and more negative all of the time, but if you just watch the playlist, because I have a playlist devoted to each type, if you watch each lecture 
um, associated with each type's playlist that I have. So just click, go to my channel, click playlists, and find your type and watch all of them. You'll notice that it's kind of like up and down in terms of me being more negative or more positive on per lecture, right? It's because I'm trying to get all the positive things and all the negative things about every type available inside this one grand narrative. You know, it's nice to just watch one lecture, but if you watch all of the lectures, you'll start to see there's actually a grand narrative behind all of my lectures when it comes to each of the single types and human nature and how it affects them, right? So INFJs included, you know, yes, some lectures are more negative than others. Some of them are more positive than others, but that's how it is with every single type, right? It's just like, so for example, who are the blank type that could be half of them would be negative for some types, half of them would be positive. And then the virtue and bias would be half of them would be more negative for the other ones, etc. It all balances out is the point. So just understand that if you see me being more negative or more positive, take it with a grain of salt and recognize that it's part of a grander narrative and it's not about me just being in a bad mood or, oh, you've had bad relationships with INFJs and you're obviously hurt by them and vengeful because of it and you've had a really bad experience about it. Or, or, or the, you've been around some really unhealthy INFJs. I really like that one, especially that's usually INFPs telling me to INFPs who think they're INFJs telling me that and I just laughed myself because you know when, when people watch my lectures they don't even realize that statistically when people take the tests that at the uh, they are inaccurate and statistically when they try to type other people they're using the letters to try to type people instead of you know the interaction styles multiplied by the temperaments which is what I teach here on this channel uh, and on the podcast with my type grid. If you don't know what the type grid is, go to csjoseph.life. You can download it on the front page. Just throw in your email. No, I'm not gonna spam you. I'm actually gonna send you unlisted uh, YouTube uh, lectures that are only available through email. And the first one we're gonna talk, the first ones we're gonna talk about are cognitive transitions. It's a fantastic lecture series. We're going to be doing that. So, but the point is just recognize, uh, you know, statistically speaking, People who claim to know their type or know the type of other people generally actually don't know. And I'm here to try to teach everybody on how to type someone quickly. Uh, you know, uh, for example, you know, uh, on the Discord server that I have, right? Uh, someone came in and was like, oh, guess my type. And someone was able to guess their type right away. And that's because they follow the interaction styles plus the temperaments to be able to quickly type people within one minute of coming into contact with them and yet never knowing them or really having a good enough chance to observe them, right? And if they're that good at typing, instead of relying on the letters or a test, we should listen to that because the non-letter way, the non-test way are actually more accurate, you know, using, using interaction styles multiplied by temperaments that's more accurate. So make sure that when you folks are watching my lectures and be like, oh, that's not my experience, make sure that your type is 100% accurate, that you did not just get it from the test, that you verify it with the type grid. And that the people in your life and your family, you're using the type grid to verify their types before you start making judgments because your judgments statistically are likely incorrect. So just be aware of that, uh, it's very important to that. And when we're talking about social compatibility, uh, you know, uh, in these lectures, it, it can be an issue. So, because some people are like, well, I'm not compatible with that type. And it's like, yes, actually you are compatible with that type. Or no, yeah, you are compatible with that type because you're not the type that you think you are. Or they're not the type of person that you think they are, etc. It can just lead to confusion. So before we jump to conclusions or make judgments, Let's make sure that we're actually using the type grid as a tool to verify your own type and type for others. And if you don't know how to use the type grid, I have a playlist of like 10 or eight to 10 lectures about how to use the type grid and every component on the type grid is explained. It's called how to type yourself and others. And in fact, I even have one lecture with the same title that has it in general if you just wanna watch that. But I recommend watching the entire playlist from start to finish. It talks about the temperaments, it talks about each of the interaction styles so you have a good idea of how to use the type grid accurately to type people. So anyway, I just wanted to bring that preface here, uh, nine minutes and 40 seconds into <laughs> this lecture. It reminds me of another lecture I did recently, <coughs> Sacred Masculinity, where I did the same thing. But I needed to get that preface so that when people 
I see like, ooh, social compatibility for INFJs. It usually brings in new people to the channel and it's important that I at least express this so that they understand that. Um, that way they stop jumping to conclusions and making improper judgments and actually verify what they know first to be true before they start making judgments, etc. That's my recommendation and it helps everyone here on the channel and on the podcast and on the Discord server and on the Mattermost server to you know, have a better, deeper discussion that's based on accuracy instead of beliefs, right? Logos instead of ethos. So anyway, that being said, uh, for those of you listening on the podcast, I will now go into uh, which types are uh, compatible um, with INFJs. Uh, but first I would offer a disclaimer. Cognitive redundancy uh, is basically where, you know, oh, like evolutionary sp evolutionarily speaking, uh, you have the you have the sixteen types and cognitive functions. They have functional compatibility. Function co functional compatibility is imagine each cognitive function is a puzzle piece, and some puzzle pieces fit well together with others. If you want to learn more about that, watch my playlist on cognitive synchronicity, and you will understand how each of the individual cognitive functions interacts with the other cognitive functions and shows you just how compatible they are with other functions, right? Or the one function that they are the most compatible with. And it's kind of like electricity or magnet or magnetism. There's a positive or negative charge. Introverted functions have a positive charge. Extroverted functions have a negative charge because the extroverted functions are trying to orbit around the uh, the introverted functions because the extroverted functions are trying to consume the um, the introverted functions. And it's like the, um, the introverted functions are providing a gravitational pull for the extroverted functions to get you know to to get on top of. So that's like Fi and then Fe is orbiting Fi, etc. Why is this? It's because, like, say, if there's a room of FE users and an FI user walks into the room, the four FE users in that room will all start feeling the exact same way that the FI user is. And the entire emotional state of the room has just changed just because one FI user walked into a room with FE users. That's a fact. It's because the FE likes to orbit around the FI. Those of you that are like, oh, but socionics doesn't say that. And I'm like, guys, I really don't give a damn about Socionics' opinion on compatibility. It is incorrect. Socionics teaches camaraderie. They label it compatibility, but they teach camaraderie. So what is camaraderie? Evolutionarily speaking, our minds have functional compatibility, but if we are not compatible with other types, we still have to come together as human beings to, you know, do tasks or to survive, for example, in the, in the environment that is the earth, right? So we have this thing called camaraderie also built in. Camaraderie and compatibility are in yin and yang equilibrium with each other for the human psyche so that human beings can still find common ground with each other even if they're incompatible and still able to form some semblance of relationships with each other to get things done. So types that have high camaraderie are people who are in the same uh, interaction style, the same temperament, the same quadra. I haven't talked about quadras yet and that's actually one thing I agree with socionics about is quadras, but I do not agree with their opinion on compatibility. Ew, duality is the most important relationship there is. No, light that on fire and blow your foot off. That's really gonna be great. No, why don't you just subject yourself to an entire lifetime of misery being married to a dualist? Like it's not, it's not recommended. Because if it's duality, you're literally in a duel. You know, when Alexander Hamilton shot Aaron Burr? Come on, you're dueling. It's not duality, man. It's a great relationship, man. No, no, that's not how it goes. So anyway, uh, so camaraderie, uh, that could be NTPs, SFPs together, because uh, there's two SFPs, it could be NTJs, NFJs, SFJs, STJs, STPs, SFPs, etc. People can find common ground, it could be ISJs, ESJs, ENJs, uh, ENPs, you know, so there would be camaraderie between an ENTP and an ENFP, for example. But camaraderie also has another, uh, has another component to it, which is really great. And it has a component of teaching. Uh, so for example, a duality relationship, you could actually learn very much from a dualist person, your polar opposite, and it actually helps you develop your subconscious better, and you may also be developing their subconscious better. It is uh, an opportunity for training and learning. 
because it makes you sharper, the relationship is edgier, right? Because as iron sharpens iron, so does one man to another, right? That's a fact. Um, thank you, King Solomon, for that nice uh, thing of wisdom. If King Solomon actually said that, who knows? I mean, we're told that's what he said, but I don't know if that's exactly true and not exactly sure if that's verifiable, but who knows? Anyway, uh, so yeah, camaraderie is a thing. So camaraderie does not equal compatibility, so be aware of that. So that's the end of this disclaimer. So again, podcast users, uh, if you are listening, uh, here is the compatibility scheme for INFJs. NPs first, SJ second, NJs third, SPs fourth. Drilling in more into the weeds, we have NFPs first, STJs second, NTPs third, SFJs fourth, SFPs fifth, NTJs sixth, STPs seventh, NFJs eighth. And the list of 16 from top to bottom for deep, meaningful friendship, because social compatibility is about friendship. It is not romantic relationship. It is not professional relationships, because romantic relationship is face-to-face. -face. Professional relationship is shoulder-to-shoulder. -shoulder. And friendship is both of those mixed together over a weighted average to create this algorithm to get the list of the 16. And I am now going to state them in order. ENFP is highest compatibility. Highest social friendship compatibility with INFJs, followed by INFP second, ESTJ third, fourth is ISTJ, fifth is ENTP, yo, um, INTP is sixth, ESFJ is seventh, ISFJ is eighth, ESFP is nine, ISFP is ten, ENTJ is eleven, INTJ is twelve, ESTP is thirteen, ISTP is fourteen, ENFJ is fifteen, and INFJs, fellow INFJs are. 16 down on the bottom. So because this is an introverted lecture, uh, we're going to be doing the lowest or least compatible on the spectrum because remember least compatibility is all about uh, arm's length, acquaintance, very shallow area of relationship. The higher on this uh, list, like towards the ENFP or the INFP, very deep meaningful friendship, etc. in terms of cognitive uh, functional compatibility. So be aware of that distinction. So because we're doing an introvert, because the experts, we did it with highest compatibility first, the followed by least, we're gonna start with least and work our way up to the highest. So here we go. INFJ plus INFJ. Wow, this looks like a fantastic friendship. No, because the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. Cognitive functions have to travel a long distance to find what they're looking for. Remember, extroverted intuition is trying to orbit introverted intuition. And it's trying to get into the introverted intuition's orbit because it's like literally an atom. Oh, and E, I want to orbit around you, but it's really hard to get to you because I have to get through all these other things' orbits. Like imagine our minds are literally solar systems colliding with each other. And are the planets going to collide or are the planets actually gonna be in nice little sync and whatnot? You know what I mean? That's like literally how our souls work. Our souls are literally like mini metaphysical solar systems. Did you know that? Well, this is how it is. Each cognitive function is kind of like a planet. Dope. And and then all of a sudden our ego is like a is like a system of solar systems, right? And then, you know, galaxies and oh wait, zooming in and out. Gosh, I like the metaphysical component of this. Really, really awesome. Uh, and this also kind of goes to show you, like, you know, our minds, uh, our bodies and our minds really, really reflect the universe back out uh, and inwardly, right? Like that song uh, that Oraga uh, did with uh, Yoko Kano called Inner Universe. I highly recommend you listen to that. It is absolutely dope. Talk about Japanese and Russian mixed together for this awesome cyberpunk uh, uh, music. Awesome. Okay, yeah, Ghost in the Shell, shoot me. But, I mean, had to go there. So, uh, expert intuition is trying to orbit around introvert intuition here, and it's having to travel long distance. It's also colliding with potential other uh, cognitive functions here in this traffic jam. Not going to go very well for it. And uh, it's like, well, I'm worried about you doing whatever you want. And, well, I'm worried about you doing whatever you want. Well, you know, I feel like you're being corrupt. Well, I feel you're corrupt. You know, I feel like your friends are crap. Well, I believe your friends are crap. And it's just like, there's just no useful here. And then imagine they're trying to mirror each other. What happens when two mirrors like are looking at each other, right? It just turns into like pure chaos. If you try to look inside, it just goes like on and on and on. And it's like, wow, that's not really useful here. 
I don't recommend this. Uh, we're being insecure about uh, their demons. Yeah, that's that's useful. Holding each other to a super high moral standard. What if one of them is more corrupt than the other? I mean, then that's just going to lead to judgments, right? And pointing fingers. And then you know what they're going to going to do? They're going to do the INFJ door slam. <laughs> And yep, not going to have anything to do with that person anymore. Move on and on to the next one. INFJ and ENFJ. Super high camaraderie. I have to make a comment about this one. Uh, because they're both NFJs, they have like super amazingly high uh, camaraderie. My aunt and uncle is actually an ENFJ married to an INFJ. And their relationship is explosive. Boom! Uh, but they've been together for like 40 years, you know, uh, and uh, like 40 plus years. So it just goes to show that if you have the ability to communicate and you have all of maturity in the world, you really can make any romantic relationship work within type. It's just the difference is, is that you're both, uh, you're trying, okay. Someone said this on the YouTube channel. I forgot who said it, but whoever said it, I owe you a huge debt of gratitude because it was a Princess Bride reference, and he was explaining that this kind of relationship is like climbing the cliffs of insanity without a rope. And it really is. If you're really, really strong, if you have a lot of mental energy, if you have a lot of maturity, if you have a decent human nurture, you're going to be able to climb the cliff of insanity and meet the other at the top. Hopefully they have the same, uh, you know, ability to climb the cliffs of insanity, right? Because, you know... Never face a Sicilian when death is on the line. Well, I mean, these two are obviously trying to do it. So, yeah, my aunt, my aunt and uncle, like, they've somehow been able to do it. And I have to applaud them because they have done the impossible. It is insanely difficult. And just to watch them in their interactions, it is really hard. But they really do love and care about each other in a deep way. And they just don't, they don't give up on each other no matter what. And it is absolutely fantastic to watch. And it, is a, and it is an example that just because you're functionally incompatible and it is super mega high effort uphill relationship, instead of just being like a nice easy, you know, going downhill with a nice little breeze, sunset going, very few clouds, the flowers are blooming, you're just going downhill a little bit, it's nice and easy, restful and whatnot, and then you see the other person over there, it's like, oh, I'm an INFJ, hello, NFP, I love you, it's so easy to get to you and whatnot, and then it's just like, okay, Nice. But, you know, we have the Cliffs of Insanity over here. Which would you like to choose, right? So, remember, the more advanced human being you are uh, in terms of maturity, mental energy, growth, human nurture, yeah, you could actually make this relationship work, and I've seen it in my own life, and that's my aunt and uncle right now. So, let's talk about it. Effie Hero is constantly trying to make F.I. Critic feel good, and yet F.I. Critic is like the black hole of feeling, where the INFJ is like, but I'm so worthless and useless all the time, and the INFJ is like, no, no, you can't believe that. I don't want you to believe that you're worthless and useless all the time, but I really, really am, but no, 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 you're not, and it just creates conflict, and it's like, no, 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 stop. Or, uh, or the INFJ telling, you know, uh, <laughs> telling the ENFJ, uh, you need to be a better person. You know, you're always worried that you're a better person at, or that you're not good enough, etc. that you're not worthy. And the ENFJ is like, well, I am, you know. And, and the ENFJ is like, why can't you remember anything for me? And then the ENFJ, INFJ is like, well, why aren't you never loyal to me? As I tricks her. And they're always trying to find loyalty to each other and obligate each other. And, and they just end up realizing that they have to really approach things from a shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder point, point. And it's really hard to have a face-to-face -face relationship in this regard. They can be friends and they have the high camaraderie going for them, but look at the amount of interference that the cognitive functions have to get through in order to be able to have that relationship. Shortest distance between two points is a straight line, but then you have cognitive functions that are matching up pessimistic versus optimistic that can also create additional conflict, and that's not exactly something I would recommend. So let's move on to INFJ plus ISTP. Remember, for the sake of these lectures, I'm doing the bottom four compatibility and then the top four compatibility for social compatibility for these lectures. And ISTP is the is third one from the bottom. This is also really interesting. Uh, ISTPs have this thing when it comes to INFJs that they stupid zone INFJs really quick. It's because that TE, um, you know, if you the ISTP, if you want something done right, do it yourself. The ISTP is walking by, watching the INFJ paint something or, or painting, and then the ISTP comes over, pulls the pulls the painting gear out of their hands, and is like, "Listen, if you want to paint, you got to do it like this." 
And which, of course, that SE parent is immediately pissing off the SI demon of the INFJ, causing SE rage. And at that point, the INFJ is just straight up raging, like, did you literally just take the roller out of my hand while I'm painting this for you, and you're telling me how to do it right? Like, this conversation, INFJ plus ISTP, literally becomes an argument about the sweeper chooses the broom, basically. You know, you can't... You can't tell someone, you know, uh, to sweep and then tell them how to sweep afterwards, right? And that's what the, the complaint, common complaint is between INFJ and ISTP. It, 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 <laughs> because the ISTP just looks at how inept the INFJ is at mechanical anything and uh, or being responsible in that way or being smart because of their lack of, you know, beliefs and with their TI child and the ISTP just walks around believing that the INFJ is stupid and inept and worthless and useless. And the ISTP, I have seen ISTPs literally call INFJs to their face and tell them how worthless they were. I've also seen an ISTP son who had an INFJ father because of their familial, uh, because of their familial relationship, he, they didn't go that far and they were able to keep it civil. But in a non-familiar relationship, this relationship can be, can be on fire because the ISTP is just constantly stressed out with the fact that they just see the INFJ and they're like so not teachable because they want to teach the INFJ with their ENFJ subconscious, but it's just not going to happen, right? It's just not going to happen. So it just turns into a, a total shit show. They're worried that the INFJ is stupid. Uh, they're trying to make the INFJ feel better, which is impossible to them because FE inferior cannot do anything for FI critic, as hard as it tries. You know, the SE parent can't interface with the demon. That's not going to work. And the ISTP is completely unaware of what the INFJ wants, so never gives the INFJ the freedom that it wants to uh, handle it. And the ESTJ uh, uh, unconscious of the ISTP just starts to control the INFJ, which just causes the INFJ to become ragey afterwards. So, point is, INFJ, first chance they get, they are so door slamming that person. They are door slammed, and they are out of their life. And yeah, great, thank God. Now I don't have to deal with this problem anymore from the INFJ or from the ISTP, excuse me. So INFJ and ESTP is very interesting. This is the duality relationship. They are dualists, right? So they're constantly in a duel with each other, etc. Or maybe it's with swords. I don't know, but I kind of like the gun thing. Uh, you know, because, I mean, who shot Aaron Burr? Alexander Hamilton. Uh, I mean, it's the 4th of July. Why can't I talk about American history, you know? So uh, INFJ, ESTP, uh, so the ESTP is always trying to obligate the INFJ, obligate the SI, SI, SI demon from SE hero. Yeah, that's going to work. Whoo, you know, or the ESTP's any demon is trying to screw over the future of the INFJ. That's going to work, you know, or, or the, uh, the TI parent, the ESTP is constantly telling TE trickster how right it is, but the INFJ is so unaware that other people have thoughts whatsoever, that unaware of other people's logical judgments that it doesn't matter what the ESTP says to the INFJ, the INFJ is just gonna think what it thinks on its own. And the ESTP is trying to show the INFJ something, trying to teach the INFJ something, trying to improve the INFJ and with their, their own INFJ subconscious and the other INFJ is just looking at him like a cow looks on an oncoming train. It's just like, I don't even understand you. We don't even speak the same language. Why are we even having this conversation? It's a waste of time. And then they end up accusing each other of being worthless. It's weird, you know, not a relationship I would recommend. You know, when the INFJ starts jumping to conclusions about the ESTP, the INFJ would end up accusing the ESTP of cheating. That's actually very common, which just enrages the ESTP. And then there's, there's a huge risk, especially if these people are in a family of some kind or actually really close in some way, shape or form, there's a huge risk of physical altercation between these two. Uh, I, I have seen that. Uh, I have seen an INFJ son get into a physical altercation with an ESTP father. One thing I can say about that relationship though, at least there was one benefit. If an ESTP is the father of an INFJ, that TI child will learn from that TI parent and it will become supercharged and super effective to the point where, I mean, for example, cause like Jesus Christ, right? That he's an INFJ, and it talks about like how you know when 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 Jesus returns to the earth to take over the world, etc. Uh, and uh, 
it's like it's like his mouth opens right and a double-edged sword comes out right what is that double-edged sword that double-edged sword literally is ti child right and when you have an estp father teaching you and trying to raise you and is so frustrated with you as an infj your ti child starts because your FE parent will get in there know that it's ethically wrong what the ESTP is doing because or morally wrong what the ESTP is doing but the ESTP doesn't even have awareness of morals because morals is down here uh, with uh, with FI trickster right so then FE kicks in it's like why are you not being moralist so then it starts to develop the TI child to use logos as the only weapon it can to hit the TE critic down here of the ESTP to use logos and that TI child uses logos and starts to teach the ESTP some things. And the ESTP will stop being abusive, not necessarily the ESTP is being abusive, I'm just saying that the INFJ is perceiving abuse on the part of the ESTP, right? They're literally perceiving that abuse. And when that happens, uh, you know, TI child just becomes overdeveloped, overdeveloped. And the INFJ literally verifies, it starts to verify every single thing that the ESTP father does keeping track of every word that they say with a log of, uh, of date and timestamps, for example. Every time they make a claim, they're always looking up on the internet with their phone right in front of them, trying to find an article that disagrees with them, for example. And it causes TE emulation almost, where they're just getting like their ethos developed to try to defeat the fact that their ESTP father is so difficult to deal with, right, for example. So that's just one way this happens. I've also seen it in relationships. I have watched an INFJ um, an INFJ uh, uh, woman and an ESTP man in a relationship and I just could never figure out why they had that but they did and it was the same thing she would literally verify with her child every single thing and just piss him off because his TI parent knew that she was right and couldn't disagree and it just turned into a, a total it turned into a fight every single time and it was really frustrating to watch I thanked both of them when they decided to break up. I was so happy. I was so happy with them. And after they broke up, because I knew people that were super compatible with them and they would be good with them, I introduced them and they were both in new relationships within two weeks after their breakup. It was fantastic. And in fact, one of those relationships is still together today. Anyway, uh, so, so just be aware that there is one real benefit to this relationship because they're dualists. They are super incompatible. Uh, there's a lot of interference. The cognitive functions have to travel such a long distance to get to where they're going because they have to pass between the ego and the shadow to get where they're going. There is one major, major, major benefit to this relationship, and we've already basically talked about it, and it's teaching. Both these types can learn from each other to develop each other and, and sharpen each other in such a way where they become absolutely amazing people, provided they're not near each other. But when they're near each other, the conflict creates diamonds. It creates diamonds because remember, diamonds are created by pressure, right? They're created by uh, pressure, pain, and suffering. And the amount of suffering between these two is freaking huge. And it really causes both human beings, their hearts, to harden into diamonds. And they literally become diamonds of human beings, sparkly, uh, flawed, but imperfectly flawed, or you know, perfectly flawed, and which is great because that's the best thing about diamonds is that they're still flawed. Because human beings, we have to suffer in life, and suffering gains us wisdom. And when we gain wisdom, we become like diamonds, and then we become shiny, right? And because we're becoming shiny like diamonds, you know, I could totally like play that Rihanna Diamonds song right now. Someone please cue it up. <sighs> One day I'll have a staff. Anyway. Uh, just, just be aware of that, you know, and this relationship, the duality relationship is really focused on causing a lot of conflict and enough suffering because it literally is the polar opposite of a person. But when they're forced to be around each other and forced to work with each other, forced to criticize each other, it creates this insanely negative, like it's like a, getting two magnets that just, you're trying to bring them together, but you can't, they just keep going. But doing that actually strengthens both magnets and makes them more effective makes them better. So they're really good apart. You shouldn't bring them together, but if you do, it'll just sharpen them and make them sharper and sharper and sharper until like they're deadly and or effective or capable in any situation that they're in. So just be aware that there are some benefits to the duality relationship. Now, let's talk about the top four compatible with the INFJ. Uh, so we're actually gonna start with the top four and first and work our way down to four. So number one, 
INFJ plus ENFP. Absolute fantastic relationship for INFJs. I highly recommend it. In fact, I actually recommend all four of these, but uh, I, I recommend this one the most. It's because the cognitive functions are able to orbit easy without any other interference from the other cognitive functions directly across the board. It is absolutely fantastic. The INFJ knows what they want at all times. The ENFP knows what they want at all times, no conflict. The ENFP knows how they feel. And the INFJ knows how the ENFP feels. It can make the ENFP feel better and make the ENFP feel worthy. No conflict, right? The INFJ always knows what they think, which is great for the ENFP because the ENFP can go to the INFJ, be, INFJ and be like, hey, what do you think about this? And the INFJ will be honest with them because the ENFP needs that honesty. The ENFP has all the reference points in the world with their TE child, but they need to verify it. Why? Because they have TE trickster and it's really hard to verify anything when you have TI trickster because you're not aware of what's true or false. Logos doesn't mean anything. You are literally an ethos bot as an ENFP, but thank God you have an INFJ around to verify what you believe. ENFPs need INFJs or TI users to help them verify what they believe and verify their belief system is absolutely critical to what they're trying to do and trying to accomplish. And it makes ENFPs even better. ENFPs, their subconscious is an ISTJ. It's a walking library of Alexandria. As they read things, develop their creed, develop their belief system, they, they, they start believing a whole bunch of things and then they see things are conflicted within them and that those inner conflicts based on all the information they're bringing in can actually lead them down the course of depravity, which is what we don't want for ENFPs. We want ENFPs to stay charitable. So one of the ways to do that, they need to verify their beliefs. So they have to go to a third party, preferably an INFJ or an ENFJ, either one will work. And NF, <coughs> there's bugs flying around in here. Um, NFJs, right? And then to verify that so that they feel good about their beliefs, so that they know that their beliefs are aligned with the truth. And that's how this, this relationship is super good for both of them because the INFJ is able to feel useful and feel worthy and feel worthful and feel self-worth because of how useful they are. The most useful tool in the tool shed to the NFP or the ENFP in this case because the INFJ is always able to share their thoughts and the INFJ all of a sudden starts to feel intelligent about things because the ENFP is constantly asking them, hey, what do you think about this? 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 And they're able to do that just fine. SE to SI. Uh, ENFPs are all about being comfortable. And guess what? INFJs always wanna make them comfortable. ENFPs are afraid of new experiences. They are afraid of doing things they've never done before. They are afraid of being outside their comfort zone. Well, INFJs are afraid of taking them out of their comfort zone or afraid of forcing them to do things that they've never done before and make them uncomfortable. So there's no conflict. Of course, there are certain times if, you know, if there's a romantic relationship, you have an INFJ woman with an ENFP uh, man, and the man is stagnating, and he's not esteeming himself, he's not doing King, Warrior, Magician, Lover, he's not doing the four pillars of self-intimacy properly, so he's not taking responsibility for meeting his own needs, he lacks personal standards, he is not enforcing his personal boundaries, and has no semblance of personal goals, that's going to bother her and cause her to lose respect for him, and then as a result, that INFJ is going to make him uncomfortable so that he starts to change, right? Because the INFJ's purpose in life is to improve people and they're realizing, she is realizing the INFJ woman in that relationship that I need to improve my husband so I'm going to make him uncomfortable and get him out there. And then because he's out of his comfort rut, he'll start to learn and then, oh, he's back on track. Thank God he's back on track. Yes, our family is good. We are moving closer to the future because the INFJ can see the future and the INFJ worries about the future of the ENFP and the ENFP worries about their own future as well. And they worry that they're not going to be worthy and because the INFJ is able to look into their future they're able to help them because if they, they observe with SE inferior that oh you're stuck in your comfort rut that means that you might not have a good future and if you're not gonna have a good future that's gonna impact my future so I need to look into some possible things to make your future better and I need to make you uncomfortable so that you're out of your comfort rut so you get back into a better future and that way I know my future is secure and you're feeling good about yourself and you're verifying your beliefs and you see what I'm saying? It's just so synergistic. Like they're literally orbiting around each other. They finish each other's sentences. They're in each other's minds. They read each other like a book, an open book. It is absolutely fantastic. I recommend this relationship big time for INFJs. So uh, if I critic, the INFJ feels bad about themselves often. They walk, they, they walk around really critical towards their self-worth and because they're so critical towards their own self-worth, 
they, they, they walk around believing that they're a bad person by default. They, they walk around believing they're worthless or useless. Well, guess what? ENFPs criticize the FI critic. So there's no conflict there. And the ENFP actually teaches the, um, the FI critic, hey, stop being so critical about your self-worth. I feel good about you. You make me comfortable. Why do you feel bad if you're making me comfortable if I feel good about you all the time? What's your problem, INFJ? And the INFJ is, oh yeah, you're right. I guess I really am useful. And it's because the ENFP remembers every single good thing the INFJ has ever done for the ENFP and can list them with TE child back to the INFJ. And the INFJ is like, wow, I really did do a good job. Oh, I'll stop feeling so bad. I'll stop feeling so worthless. Thank God for that. ENFPs can really keep INFJs on track. And INFJs can keep ENFPs from getting depraved. ENFPs can help INFJs keeping from being corrupted. It is dope. So then we have TI Trickster where we talk about the lack of verification. And INFJs are not, they don't really, belief systems don't mean anything to them, just truth does. Ethos is everything to an ENFP. Logos is everything to an INFJ. INFJs are thinkers, ENFPs are feelers, even though INFJs have an F up here, that doesn't really mean anything because they have TI child. They have a source of T, which is an introverted T function in their top four functions. That means they are a thinker, okay? I know it says INF, but the F doesn't really mean much. They are a thinker. The ENFPs are feelers because they have FI in their top four. If it was FE in the top four, then they would technically be a thinker because FE means there's also TI in the top four because they're on an axis with each other, right? If you need to know more about that, watch my lecture series on cognitive axis, okay? Because the functions are like orbit around each other and then they orbit around other people and it's just this amazing atomic system with electrons and protons and things orbiting around nucleuses of atoms and it's just, and it's like, like solar systems and it's awesome. So, uh, also, the INFJ doesn't really care very much about their past, and the ENFP doesn't care about their past either, so the ENFP is not really going to delve into the past of the INFJ, but the INFJ is going to delve into the past of the ENFP, which really helps. And because of that, the ENFP ends up being super, super mega loyal to the INFJ and is giving everything the INFJ needs. This is the friendship to get. I recommend it. Also, I recommend the INFP for INFJs. This is also the friendship to get. It's basically the exact same as the ENFP relationship. The difference is that there is some built-in humility here because the INFJ is super, super willful, but the INFP is responsible about managing the wills of others. So the INFP can provide, the ENFP could definitely warn the INFJ, but the INFP can even provide more precise pessimism about future stuff to the INFJ and provide that INFJ warnings and it can really help. It's like the hermit helping the sage because the INFJ is the sage type. The dreamer is very hermitish and it's kind of interesting how that works. You know, and the INFP is insanely moral, but sometimes their morals could get corrupted because it's corrupted by their ethos. And then the INFJ who knows a lot about corruption uses their FE parent to remind the flying hero, you know, hey, you're actually doing a bad job right now because there's collateral damage to what you're doing. You should probably slow your roll. And then the FI hero is like, oh yeah, you're right because TE inferior sees the damage I'm doing to the children, I'll stop doing that and I'll listen to you. And because of that, there's built-in respect and built-in humility amongst the functions. And as a result, they can have a great relationship, a similar relationship to INFJ and ENFP. It's almost identical, except there's built-in humility and respect, mutual respect for the functions here, here, and here. The, the difference is though, that built-in humility and respect, it's not there by default for INFJ and ENFP, which can create conflict in certain cases. The fireworks and all the benefits are on like super mega high with INFJ plus ENFP, but the negatives could also be just super high and super explosive. But as long as the ENFP remains loyal to the INFJ, and as long as the INFJ remains patient and is not going to door slam the ENFP, they can always talk it out. They can always have revolution, uh, resolution. It just takes patience. It just takes truth, logos, patience, and then it also, you know, it basically all their functions have a role in that situation when the conflict arise. And, you know, ENFPs just need verification of their beliefs. And INFJs need to not feel worthless all the time or useless all the time. They need to be reminded of that. They just need that loyalty, for example. And ENFPs need to remain comfortable. Just like INFPs need to remain comfortable for INFJs. Remember, NFPs do not care about what's true for themselves. They care about what's true with others, but they do not care about what's true for themselves. 
they, they feel about the truth. They feel, they, they, their feelings are attached to what beliefs are. Everything is about what they believe about what is true or false. It's not about what is actually true or false. That's an INFJ thing. That's a logos thing. That is not ethos, right? So they're very ethos focused, so be aware of that. Now, INFJ, ESTJ. This is a fun one. This is number three on the social compatibility list. It is also the most common marriage for INFJs that I have seen, other than like INTPs, actually. INFJs and INTPs get together uh, a lot, but... INFJ ESTJ is the most common marriage that I have seen in the United States of America. And actually, there is this one ESTJ girl who had, she was a model and she was on Instagram or whatever. And some guy who, who, uh, who is an INFJ started talking her up, uh, saying, hey, you know, wow, you're really beautiful. Uh, you know, you're, you're pretty fantastic. Uh, you're an inspiration to me. Um, and he just said that one time. And, you know, and then all of a sudden, like three weeks later, uh, he, he had to go to a conference for work and then she put posts on her Instagram that uh, she was also going to that, that same conference and then he messaged her and he's like, wow, I didn't know you were going to be at the conference. This would be amazing. I get, I get to see you at the conference. What's your booth number? And then they met, they hit it off and they're married now, right? And, you know, and, and of course, you know, this INFJ guy, he's actually been, he, she's been teaching him about how to do stuff in the gym and he's actually pretty buff now and they're super healthy and it's, and it's a really great relationship. All because they have this thing where they can actually improve each other with self-development. It's because the, the children are uh, assisting the heroes, riding on the backs of the heroes, the heroes are flying safe around the world, and they're in like TE Hero, really develops TI, super strong set of beliefs, but verified by TI Nemesis, helps TI Child develop itself, so it continues to verify and whatnot. And TI Nemesis also kind of sets a boundary for which INFJs can operate because INFJs lack an ethos, but they have a boundary with which they can work in and that's an ethos boundary and they can be all logos E inside, right? And the ESTJ provides that. The ESTJ reduces chaos in the life of the INFJ and they just really appreciate it and there's always a plan and there's no question as to what's happening, you know? Although NFPs are really great at plans as well. INFJs need plans, but they suck making the plans. Uh, NFPs don't really need plans, but they're really great at making plans, so they end up making the plan for the INFJ to execute, and it's kind of very similar here with this relationship. The ESTJ makes that for the INFJ, and the ESTJ any child is all about giving what the uh, NI hero wants, uh, and SI parent likes to receive the experience from the SE inferior, and SI parent doesn't make SE inferior feel insecure. SI parent is very patient with SE inferior, and it's very specific about the kind of experience it wants to receive from the INFJ, especially in the bedroom. And there's a lot of communication here so that, they, that uh, the SE inferior is never afraid after a while that the parent is not getting you know, uncomfortable with it. So it really has you know, no issue there. And then uh, FE parent also does the same thing for FI inferior. FI inferior feels very insecure about its self-worth. ESTJs walk around afraid that they're bad people, but the FE parent helps teach them that they're not, they don't need to be afraid to be bad people. Not only that, the cognitive functions have everything they need in the top four. Uh, and within the ego, they don't have to go down to the shadow, so it's also pretty awesome. Same thing for INFJ ENFP and uh, INFJ INFP, super same thing. And uh, yeah. Uh, down here, you know, expert intuition is always worried about the intentions, worried that the ESTJ would betray them, but that would never happen because the ESTJ never does what they want ever. So that is not even an issue. The INFJ doesn't have to worry about the ESTJ betraying them because the ESTJ is hardcore loyal to SI parent, has no concept of wanting anything else anyway because they're so bent on just having the INFJ around at all times because that's what they're used to. ENFPs and INFPs are super similar, but you know, it, it's how comfortable the INFJ is. The NFPs are not just loyal to anyone, so INFJs may have to put in a little bit more effort to make their NFPs comfortable, but it will really, really last longer and resonate longer and has so many more benefits, and, and the NFPs react to all of the sensations in a very pleasurable way to what the INFJ is doing, even if it's just jewelry that the INFJ is making themselves and then adorning it on their bodies or, or wearing it around their wrists or whatever, really cool jewelry, or if it's the music they're making, these types are super sensitive to that. They have really higher sensitivity for it and they react to it and it makes it gives joy to the NFJs. SCJs it's similar but not as much uh, because SI parent is very pessimistic in that regard. And sure, SI inferior has been 
pessimistic, but Essie and Fury is also pessimistic, so it kind of doesn't matter because they cancel each other out because they're both on the same spectra. When I or spectrum, when I talk about spectrum, watch my video on uh, my lecture on cognitive uh, on cognitive spectra. What are the eight cognitive spectra? It just shows you how our cognitive functions are like radios tuning into each other, uh, transceiver mode, etc. Very important. Oh, crap, we're getting up to fifty minutes here. Maybe I really am going to make an hour. So anyway. Uh, so TI, uh, so, okay, hold on, where are we at here? You know, and, and INFJs are just unaware of what ESTJs think, but ESTJs are already worried about what they think about anyway, so it's not, there's really no conflict there. And then SE, uh, SE critic is not really going to give SID when a bad experience, unless the INFJ really deserves it, like they're dressed wrong or they're walking around with their shoes untied. If they're being unsafe, the uh, ESTJ will call them out on it. So it, it's not really that big of an issue. And the ESTJ doesn't really care about how other people feel, but the INFJ already kind of feels worthless anyway. So the FE is just, the FE demon's not really going to do much to a critic anyway, because the critic's already expecting that kind of abuse or that kind of a hit from people. So no issue. INFJ plus ISTJ, super similar uh, to the ESTJ, except, um, like imagine the same kind of relationship, except the heroes, you know, and, and it could have some huge benefits for self-development for both types. The problem is there is a risk because the hero is, has so much more force than a parent function uh, with INFJ, ESTJ, you have FE parent and SI parent, but then you have NI hero and SI hero interfacing directly with the uh, 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 directly with the inferior functions and they can be crushed, those inferior functions can be crushed under that weight. So how to deal with that? Well, if they have higher, um, if they have a uh, pretty good maturity and pretty good uh, comer or not camaraderie, but uh, you know uh, development in this area, they can uh, find themselves. Uh, you know, it, it could be actually really beneficial because the hero is leading the way and developing the inferior function in a better. And you always want to develop your inferior function because that gives you access. It's the gateway function into your subconscious, and by getting access to your subconscious, you become the better version of yourself, right? And it's the next step towards enlightenment. You have to be able to master all of your gateway functions in your mind in order to reach enlightenment because what that does is it gets all four sides of your mind in perfect balance with each other and you're able to bounce around all four sides of your mind. Yes, you live in your ego predominantly, but you're able to use your subconscious, your unconscious, your superego all the time and they're, they're in agreement with each other, they're not in conflict or you're listening to them when they are in conflict and you're able to exude wisdom as a result. And that is enlightenment, when your mind is balanced and in harmony with each other and you don't have inner conflict anymore because all four sides of your mind are focused together on accomplishing things themselves. It's when you have the four human beings that are literally inside your mind, they're no longer fighting each other for dominance, but they're working with each other. You have inner unity. That is what enlightenment is. And in order to do that, you have to master your gateway functions. Gateway functions are the hero, the inferior, the because uh, um, the hero is the gateway to the ego, the inferior is the gateway to the subconscious, the nemesis is the gateway into the unconscious, and the demon function, also known as the parasite, is the gateway into the superego. If you master those four gateway functions, you can become your enlightened self. You can become your absolute best self that you could possibly get, right, uh, within the, the 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 context of being like an INFJ, for example, or any of the sixteen types. So this relationship, really, it can either crush uh, the inferior functions and really inhibit each other, or they can be super supportive of the inferior functions and actually make them there. I will say, though, I don't really often see romantic relationships of INFJ plus ISTJ that much, but friendship-wise, or even professional relationship-wise, it is absolutely amazing because the ISTJ just has this super huge mastery Library Alexandria, Mastery of Documentation, and they're super organized, and they're very consistent, and it makes everything so much easier for the INFJ to be in that situation. Although the ISTJ is a little afraid of what the INFJ wants all the time, because they're very wanty, but at the same time, the INFJ is afraid of giving the, the ISTJ a bad experience, so there's a, there is some back and forth there. At the same time, the INFJ is worried that the ESTJ, that the ISTJ will screw them over one day, which is not going to happen, happen because ISTJs are all about duty. They don't care about what they want at all. And they're also worried, <laughs> and ISTJs are also kind of, uh, you know, worried that the INFJ won't be loyal to them in some way. It's just this weird loyalty conflict. But in reality is, the INFJ really wants to seek the ISTJ's approval 
And so the ICJ says, I feel good about you. I'm getting a good experience about you. Let's continue to be friends, right? I will continue to be loyal to you because you do all these great things for me. And I have this huge list because I'm keeping track of everything you do, which happens all the time because SI Hero literally remembers everything in the same way SI Parent does, SI Child, and SI Inferior does because these four types, they all just remember all the things and it's awesome and it keeps the INFJ, like the INFJ is literally able to take these four types and turn them into walking totems. You know, like totems from uh, Inception. Totems being like containers of memories. You know, a picture on a wall, that's a totem, right? Because you look at the picture in a room and an SE user is able to look at the photo and be reminded and get all of their memories back from that moment in time because it's a totem. And human beings, SI users, are walking totems because SE etches the SI of that person's soul, and it's a permanent etch. It is a permanent etch, and that person will always remember and feel that etching from the SE user, which is really great for INFJs because SE inferior is etching SI users so that SI users always remember them, and they're never forgotten. Anyway, this concludes uh, this uh, episode of Social Compatibility on INFJs, Season 12, Episode 13. If you found this uh, lecture educational, useful, insightful, enlightening, please uh, leave a subscribe. Uh, please subscribe to the channel here on YouTube and on the podcast, and leave a like while you're at it. If you have any questions about INFJs, please leave it in the comments section. I'll do my best to answer your questions. Uh, please note that I am traveling to Seattle this week, so uh, lectures may be kind of intermittent, but I should still keep it up, and. Uh, We'll see how that goes. I'm going to be doing uh, some more type comparisons, and I'm also going to be doing uh, more lectures on uh, uh, the Human Nurture series, season 13 that we're doing, about uh, the mature masculine and the mature feminine as well. So, awesome. Otherwise, thanks for uh, being my audience. You're fantastic. Uh, thanks for being patient with me, INFJs, especially when I'm doing negative things said about you, and I'm doing positive things when I'm said about you. I realize that's how it is, but again, it's all part of a grander narrative. So regardless, I'm very thankful for all of you, and I'm, uh, and I'm grateful as well. So with all that being said, see you guys next time.